Okay. So the next presentation is by Martina Marconi. Phytoplankton assemblages in an Antarctic fjord: composition, diversity, and productivity. Okay, you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see it. When you want, you can start. Yes. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Martina Massioni and I'm going to talk about this presentation called Phytoplankton Assemblages in an Antarctic Fjord Composition, Diversity and Productivity. So our work takes place here in the Antarctic Peninsula, more specifically in the Western Antarctic Peninsula. The Western Antarctic Peninsula hosts the largest amount of fjords on the entire Antarctic continent. Fjords are coast areas that are surrounded by glaciers. They are channels through which large amounts of meltwater enter to the sea and are therefore directly affected by global warming. Studies in the Arctic point out the fjord as sources of nutrients that stimulate phytoplankton growth. Phytoplankton in the Western Antarctic Peninsula fjords is believed to be highly productive due to the large creek conglomerations we found there. This work is part of a multidisciplinary project called Fjord Eco that seeks to understand the processes in an Antarctic fjord located in the Western Antarctic Peninsula. It is called Amber Bay. So for this particular study, we try to find out if there are spatial and temporal differences in the phytoplankton composition of Amber Bay, if their primary productivity inside and outside the fjord was similar, and if there are changes in productivity, if they are related to the phytoplankton composition. So this is our bay. This is Amber Bay. This is a fjord that it has this coast surrounded by five glaciers that discharge the meltwater into the ocean. And the samples were carried out during two consecutive years, during November and December the 25th. 15, so it would be a spring here in green. And during April the 2016, that will be autumn, that is here in uh, orange. And we divide the sampling area into major zones that would be the Gurlitch Strait, the Fjord Mouth, and the Inner Fjord. Uh, we also sample in a, in a station placed in the shelf that is not depicted here just to make comparisons. And at each sampling station, we measure several environmental conditions. And the water samples were taken at three different depths, 50%, 12%, and 1% of light penetration. A total of 92 quantitative samples were analyzed under the microscope following eutermal. And some of them were further analyzed by, uh, under electron microscope. And for the primary production, it was calculated through incubation with carbon-14 following Steeman and Nielsen. So the results showed very different patterns of a phytoplankton distribution during spring and autumn. As we can see here, are abundance and biomass um, profiles uh, of phytoplankton in the fjord. So we can see that total abundance and biomass values were 10 times lower in autumn than in spring. Also, the distribution of the phytoplankton was very different. During spring, the phytoplankton abundance and biomass was mostly um, recorded here at the first 20 meters of the, of the water column. And during autumn, the pattern was different. The phytoplankton was more homogeneously distributed in the upper water column. Uh, in the 50, if, in the first 50 meters deep. For this study, we found three main phytoplankton assemblages in the study area. We made a cluster and uh, we performed a cluster analysis, a hierarchical grouping analysis, um, 
on the relative biomass of the total species per station. So we have all the stations here. We have a S for a spring stations and A for autumn station. And we found these three different assemblages that differ not only in the biomass composition, that also differ spatially and temporally. So the first assemblage was mainly present in the inner fjord and only found during spring. The second assemblage was in the fjord mouth and the Gerlach Strait during spring and was on the shelf during autumn. And the third assemblage was rare during spring. It was in the inner fjord, but very close to the glaciers and was in the whole fjord during autumn. And as we say, the composition between the three assemblages is different. So we have here biomass distribution of the major um, phytoplankton groups. And we can see for the first assemblage here, the cryptophytes were the ones that were most uh, important biomass contributors. And they were followed by small flagellates, prasinophytes, and honor, honor more dinoflagellates. This is how was, uh, this assemblage looked like. They were all of these teardrop shaped cryptophytes here observer under the electron microscope. For the second assemblage, the dominant organisms were the microplanktonic diatoms. Uh, as we can see, some of the, the main taxa were Cocinodiscus bovet, Thalassiocera, Ketoceros, Eucampi Antarctica, and Anontella waste flushy was the most important in terms of biomass here. And for the third assemblage, we can see the biomass was very, very low, and it was mostly represented by Onarmore dinoflagellates. So we have Onarmore dinoflagellate, the, the most important one were smaller than 50 microns. They were followed by a small flagellate and nanoplanktonic titan like Fragilaria obsidiana. And what happens with the primary production? Here we can see the bar plots showing different, uh, the three assemblages, um, biomass uh, contribution of the major groups. We can see the first assemblage has the, the samples with the highest biomass, the second assemblage, and the third assemblage had the lowest biomass. And we also can observe here the primary production in these uh, black lines. And we can observe here in those samples that had similar biomass, uh, biomass values, but different composition here. This one in the first assemblage was dominated by cryptophyte, and this one in the second assemblage was dominated by diatoms the primary production values were very different. So at similar values of biomass, different composition means different primary production. We also observe a high values of primary production of average primary production. I mean, a average in the integrated in the water column. It was different for the three assemblages and the second assemblage was the one that has a that seems to be the most productive. Also, very high values of integrated primary pollution were found here, especially during spring. We uh, find values up to 3,500 milligrams of carbon per meter square per day. And, of, and also, we can see here that primary pollution was significantly lower in atom than in spring, even here with those some the in this assemblage that have samples from spring and from autumn, we can see the autumn uh, samples had very lower uh, lower primary production than those from spring. So the phytoplankton assemblages observed in Amber Bay and the Gerlach Strait have been previously observed in other coastal and open areas from the Western Antarctic Peninsula. And for the atom, the literature is very scarce, although it is considered that the phytoplankton community in this area is dominated by nanoplant, just as we found. The values of primary pollution we found in Amber Bay 
are comparable to summer values of other nearby coastal areas. So we are comparing here spring values to summer values, so they are very high. And our results highlight the role of diatoms as primary producer in these Western Antarctic Peninsula areas in accordance with other studies. And we show here that it happens also uh, even when the diatoms are not found in large, in la large amounts, I mean when they are blooming. And despite the cryptophyte dominated assemblage was less productive to the diatom dominated one, the primary production is still in this assemblage was comparable to that found in other uh, coastal areas also during summer. So to conclude, our results suggest that Amber Bay is a fjord with high primary production and biomass accumulation during spring. The spring primary productivity in Amber Bay was even comparable to that recorded on other Western Antarctic Peninsula areas of high phytoplankton accumulation during summer. And in this study, we found these three main phytoplankton assemblages with a different spatial and temporal distribution. And two of these assemblages were recurring the, um, during spring and autumn. And one of the assemblage was markedly more productive, dominated by microbantonic diatom, especially the species the Odontella waste flush. So thank you for listening. And if you have questions, I will love to answer them. Um, I want to thank all of the people involved in your Eco project. Thank you. Oh, I stop sharing. Thank you for your talk, Martina. And next speaker is Mia Momberg from University of Pretoria. And her presentation is about wind as driver of fine scale variation in plant communities. Um, hi, everybody, and I hope you can see my screen now. Um, I would like to thank you all for virtually attending this presentation, even though we couldn't all meet in person today. Uh, my name is Mia Momberg, and today I will be talking about how wind drives variation in plant communities. And this work forms a part of my PhD thesis under the supervision of Peter LaRue, David Heading, and Ms. Calvorto. It is well known that climate change is affecting communities and leading to changes in living communities. And these changes are further predicted to continue. Yet exactly how these changes will affect communities in future remains a key challenge in ecology. Some of the previously observed changes show relatively consistent trends. For example, most species are shifting their ranges upslope. But even to these, deviations and exceptions exist. Most studies that investigate climate change strongly focus on temperature and precipitation. And therefore, we need an understanding of more climatic factors in order to get a fuller picture, pic, fuller picture and to improve the accuracy and the transferability of our models. In particular, need to focus on those elements that are mechanistically linked to plant performance, like wind. Wind structures natural systems, and it's particularly in the subantarctic and the Antarctic, it is a system that is an important element in shaping the ecosystem. Wind has physiological impacts and provides mechanical stresses on plants. One can distinguish between two types of wind, extreme winds like hurricanes and tornadoes, and chronic winds, which blow on a regular basis. In particular, the effects of these chronic winds on biological communities is underexplored. Yet, global wind patterns are changing at a fast speed, emphasizing even more how important it is for us to gain an understanding of how wind affects communities. In 1959, Wilson noted the shortcoming on wind-related research and this gap largely, largely remains today. Therefore, 
We aim to determine the effect of chronic wind on plant communities by investigating its impact on species richness, vegetation cover, species composition, and did this at a fine scale to capture the variation at a community level. This study was conducted on Subantarctic Marion Island, which has a windy climate due to its position in the Roaring Forties. Marion Island is indicated on this map of wind speed by the red circle, and you can see from the map that this area of the Southern Ocean experiences higher wind speeds than the rest of the world. Data was collected on the northeastern side of Marion Island in nine study grids, each consisting of 160 quadrants, resulting in a total of 1,440 quadrants of one square meter in size each. Within each quadrant, the identity and the cover of all the vascular plant species was recorded, along with several abiotic variables, including rock cover, soil depth, soil moisture, soil temperature, and pH. Drone imagery was also obtained for all of the grids, which was then used to produce a fine scale digital surface model for each grid. An estimate of wind speed was obtained from a computational fluid dynamics model, which has been created of wind flow over the island in collaboration with the engineering department. These two metrics were then used to estimate a wind stress score. This was done by first getting a wind exposure index value using SOGA GIS, and then multiplying this exposure value with a speed value for a resulting wind stress value. The maximum and minimum wind stress for each quadrant was then extracted. To determine the importance of wind as a driver of species richness and vegetation cover, two statistical approaches were used, generalized additive models and generalized linear models. For both approaches, two models were run. One with all the other environmental variables, but excluding wind, and then a fuller model, which included wind. Our next step here will be to add spatially explicit models. The differences in species composition were then investigated using non-metric multidimensional scaling. For both the GAM and the GLM, the fuller model, which included wind, performed significantly better than the simple model, which did not include wind. As further evidence that wind plays a significant role in determining species richness, wind was one of the five most important predictive variables in both approaches. This indicates that wind plays a strong role in determining the species richness. Rock cover and soil pH were also consistently among the five most important predictors. As for species richness, the full model for vegetation cover also performed significantly better than the simple model, again indicating the importance of wind. For vegetation cover, both the minimum wind stress and the maximum wind stress were consistently among the five most influential predictive variables. The rock cover and the potential direct incident radiation were also consistently important predictors. Moving over to species composition, wind remains an important driver. And again, we see maximum wind stress as one of the five most influential drivers, along with winter soil temperature, rock cover, pH, and soil depth. Here we show that wind has an effect on three different plant community metrics, richness, cover, and composition, as evidenced by models that include wind variables performing significantly better than models without wind variables, and by wind metrics consistently being among the most important predictors in all models. Therefore, the changes being observed in global wind patterns due to climate change may affect the distribution of individual species and habitat types. For example, changing wind speeds will have large impacts on communities which are impacted by salt spray. And even in systems which don't currently experience frequent wind, plants and animals here may struggle to adapt to sudden changes in wind patterns. We expect that wind is an important driver in most ecosystems, 
and therefore that changes in wind speeds need to be considered explicitly when forecasting the impacts of climate change on living systems. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you were blown away by this topic and that you remember to think about wind. I would like to thank the SANAC program of the National Research Foundation for funding this work. And I hope that I'll be able to discuss this in more detail with you all next week during the discussion session. And if you would like to view any part of this presentation again, please um, just view the video link, which is available on the SCAR website. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mia. So the next presentation will be by Kochen Otsken. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> the title is Food Web Structure and Community Composition of 13 Lakes and Ponds Across the Antarctic Peninsula. I think he had some some problems and maybe he Yes, he is not could not get away from him. yes. Sometimes people get some confused with the icons there and and, and press the Okay to turn, to turn off the, the call. So we just wait and, and you yeah, will he's connected right now. Okay, he's back. You have to turn on your microphone. I'm I'm terribly sorry. Uh, when I try to present, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I'm we can sorry. hear you. And I'm terribly you. sorry about this. I hope it works now. Okay, we can see we can see uh, your presentation. Oh, that's great. I'm I'm terribly sorry again. When I try to allow some permissions in the computer, it basically shut down all the windows. So I had to connect again. Uh, sorry, please ex accept my apologies and. Hi again, I'm Korhan Özkan uh, from the Middle East Technical University uh, from Turkey. And I'm trying, I'm trying to present some of our results uh, on our research on the food webs of the ecosystems, uh, coastal ecosystems along the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, our project is, as I told you, is based on the uh, food web ecology along the Antarctic Peninsula. And we have three major focuses. Uh, one of them is the uh, inland lake ecosystems, uh, trying to characterize their, uh, their food web. And uh, our major aim is uh, to sample a large gradient in environmental uh, parameters as well as latitude, and trying to use this information to project for potential uh, future changes in these ecosystems. So we uh, basically did a snapshot survey uh, in the lakes that we sampled. This includes samples for water chemistry, environmental DNA, uh, stable isotopes, uh, and also the biotic communities like phytoplankton, zooplankton, and also the epilytic uh, algae, as well as uh, pigments in the water column. This is one part of our scope and what we uh, hope to do is uh, after we have enough uh, variability in, the, in these parameters that we can use space for time substitution and to have a better prediction for the, uh, for the future of these, these communities. Another focus of our research is on polyecology. Uh, we got a short core from an island in Robert Island and uh, a lake from Robert Island, and we are trying to use the diatoms as an indicator for the past uh, ecology ecosystem changes in, in this lake. And the last focus of our research is the trophic ecology of the top predators, 
and we are using the environmental DNA samples uh, from their uh, scats and uh, trying to understand their position in the food web. Um, these samples have been, uh, we conducted, or basically I was attending the cruises, so I conducted these samples, samplings, during the Turkish Antarctic expeditions along the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, you might have heard that Turkey had a recent ambition to do research uh, in Antarctica, and therefore there has been uh, national expeditions since 2017, and this year it has, the fourth one was conducted. So I had a chance to attend in 2018 and 2019. And uh, in 2018, uh, the, the cruise started from King George Island and I was a member of the team who had a research camp in Robert Island for 25 days. So I had a chance to conduct these samplings in Robert Island. In 2019, it, it was a research cruise starting from King George uh, all the way to Horseshoe Island and at various locations we had a chance to stop and uh, conduct uh, samplings. Uh, uh, one of our focus is this top predators in the food web. Uh, this uh, long cruise enabled us to sample several locations. So we managed to get uh, samples from seven top predators at more than nine locations. and. Uh, we are in the optimization phase. Uh, we finished up the optimization for DNA extractions. Corona slowed us a bit, uh, but we have a poster about this and you can find more details uh, about our findings. Uh, the second part is, uh, again, the paleoecology uh, in, in Robert Island. Uh, during our stay, uh, we had a chance to get a short core from uh, a lake in Robert Island that is located in the Coppermine Peninsula on the edge of the ice cap. It's a periglacial lake and most likely recently formed. Um, uh, this lake is situated approximately 40 meters above sea level, uh, so it's isolated from the sea. It's a shallow lake, uh, less than three meters deep. Uh, it's a small lake with uh, 1.5 uh, hectares or so lake surface area. It is a freshwater lake and it has uh, oligotrophic conditions, low nutrient concentrations and low chlorophyll concentrations reflecting that too. Um, uh, Sabah is here. Uh, she, uh, she is a, one of my PhD students and she is working on the diatom communities. So we managed to finish to count the diatoms and we see that there are some shifts through the uh, length of the core, uh, there are some, some significant diatoms, some diatoms have significant increase and decrease through time. We haven't finished the biogeochemistry and the dating yet, uh, but again we will have a poster uh, regarding that uh, research and you can find more details there. Today I'll try to present more details about the snapshot surveys that I conducted during these two expeditions. Uh, this includes 10 lakes and 3 ponds across the western side of Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, as I told you, we, at each location, some of them are opportunistic, so we had very, very small time available to do the samplings during uh, the, the stop of the ship, a few hours time to time, but we try to, I try to sample as much as possible, including the water uh, chemistry and the physical properties, uh, major organism groups, uh, eDNA samples, and stabilized those. Uh, so these fieldwork have been conducted in these five islands. Uh, RD Island has the uh, uh, most northernmost island. We sampled the lake there. Uh, Robert Island, uh, four lakes, uh, and then Livingston Island, one lake, and Horseshoe Island, four lakes. And on the way, we also sampled three ponds in uh, Galindez Island. Uh, these islands are characteristic uh, Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, these lakes are characteristic Antarctic Peninsula lakes. They are very small, uh, approximately half a hectare to two hectares. Uh, they are very shallow, 0 0.3 meters to three meters depth. Uh, some of them are near to the sea and with strong connection. Not, none of these lakes are permanently connected to the sea. 
but some of them are very near to the sea, something like 10 meters, so very strong infraction. Uh, some other lakes are at altitudes of 150 meters and a few hundred meters from the sea, so more isolated. So let me present you some of the results regarding the chemical composition of these lakes. So this is a graph showing different lakes with nutrient concentrations, uh, phosphate, uh, silicate, and uh, total inorganic nitrogen concentrations, as well as conductivity as this blue line. Uh, so we have a strong gradient, uh, quite variability in the uh, water chemistry and nutrient concentrations in these lakes. And it's mostly coinciding with the conductivity, except for these three ponds, uh, but it is understandable because these three ponds are located in an area where there are big penguin colonies. So these nutrient concentrations mostly reflecting their effect uh, other than the direct sea interaction. And here on the below, you see the PCA plot, principal components analysis, uh, amount of varied ordination of this uh, chemical composition of these lakes. And we can see that the lakes are uh, very well ordinated along the gradient of conductivity and nutrients, mostly reflecting the effect and transport of nutrients from the sea, as well as uh, ordinated on the second gradient uh, for phosphate and total inorganic nitrogen, mostly, uh, reflecting these ponds 11 and 12, reflecting the effect of animals on the nutrient concentrations. And uh, we couldn't finish the entire analysis, but we had results for the water column pigments, uh, which should represent the primary producers in the water column, the phytoplankton groups, as well as the diatom composition from the epilytic communities in these lakes. Epilytic means the periphytons or the algae growing on rocks. Uh, so what we see again uh, here is this, sorry, here is the HPLC analysis of the pigments in the water column. And we see that there's a huge gradient in terms of both abundance and the composition, as well as we have this epileptic diatoms, which has a strong gradient in the richness uh, along these, these lakes. So at first, I would like to show you the patterns along the conductivity, phosphate, and total inorganic nitrogen, these basic nutrient gradients for diatom richness on the left and pigment diversity on the right. And uh, first of all, we don't have any significant patterns because partially because we have limited, sorry about that, we have limited amount of limited sites. Uh, but what we see at least uh, with the extreme values of conductivity and the nutrients, we see a, a, a no decrease or high levels of uh, pigment diversity. Uh, it reflects well that this pigments in the pelagic water column is basically regulated by the low nutrient uh, conditions. And even with very high nutrient conditions, it still has no negative effect on the diversity of the pigments. Uh, the opposite pattern is at least uh, suggested by the diatom uh, richness because with the high end of the conductivity, phosphate and uh, nitrogen uh, concentrations, you see a sharp decline in the diatom richness. And this might indicate that the diatom communities, they are benthic, so they have a better reach to the nutrient pool in the sediment, uh, considering the nutrient pool in, in Antarctica. Uh, so any extreme increase in the nutrients might reflect a competitive pressure on, on these communities. But uh, these are just some speculations because we don't have significant results. Uh, what about the community structure other than the richness or diversity? Uh, here you see the RDA plot, uh, a multivariate analysis that is uh, analyzing the uh, Hellinger distance transformed diatom communities in regard to the environmental parameters in these, in these lakes. And we have a very significant ordination. Uh, it's highly significant, and it explains 50% of the variation in the uh, diatom communities. And we see, again, a two strong gradient. One of them in the first axis is the conductivity and the silicate concentrations, uh, partially also correlating with the nutrients. That basically suggests the effect of the 
uh, C e interaction that's transporting the nutrients. Uh, and the second axis is mostly uh, suggesting the effect of the uh, penguin colonies and seal colonies because these penguin pond and the blue pond is located in Galindas Island with uh, significant uh, large uh, penguin colonies and we see that this uh, these diatom communities responding to to these uh, gradients. Uh, what about the phytoplankton pigment communities? This time the RDA is the same kind of ordination, but this time so Euclidean distance transform pigment data uh, with the environmental parameters. And again, the pigment composition is highly significantly uh, related to the environmental uh, conditions of these lakes, especially the nutrients and the conductivity, I, I'm sorry, and uh, it explains 90% of the variation in the in the pigment data, and basically the, the pigment concentrations, most of the pigment concentrations is aligned along an axis of uh, nutrients and conductivity, again representing the transport from the nutrient transport from the sea, but also the second axis, again Another major component uh, regarding the, 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 the nutrient uh, transport mediated by the animals, because this L, L5 is the uh, lake in Ardi Island, which also hosts a very, very large penguin colony. So overall, two major conclusions. Uh, first, the inland aquatic ecosystems along the Antarctic Peninsula have strong variation, both in environmental gradients and by the communities. And these compositions of the benthic and the pelagic primary producers are strongly linked to the environmental gradients reflecting the nutrient transport from the sea mediated by distance or animal movements. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, both for your understanding for the uh, bad start, uh, my, my computer problems, and also for your time. And I would like to express my gratitude for the organizers taking the burden to organize uh, this uh, symposium. And I would like to uh, express my gratitude for several individuals who helped during the field work. And I would like to acknowledge the funding from Turkish NSF, uh, ex uh, Antarctic program, as well as the university funds. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your talk, very nice talk. And then we have Dr. Bayona Tipgat from Ghent University. And the title of the presentation is Diversity, Biogeography and Potential Parasite Host Interactions of Aquatic Fungi in Subpolar Lakes. Please turn on your microphone. Okay, second attempt. So do you see my presentation? I don't see anything. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody, or at least yeah, what I'm... Sorry, before you start, yeah. can you select the full screen mode? Full screen mode. Mm. And where do I um, full screen? Yes. Is this okay? Mm, no, we can see your presentation, but we not see the PowerPoint file, not the full screen. Yeah. As before, you can select of presenting your full screen instead of your presentation. All right. Um, okay. Screen. Okay. 
not okay or so I have a full screen selected here. We can see it. Yes, now it's fine. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so, okay, good afternoon. My name is Björn Teithat. I'm a postdoc at the Laboratory of Protostology and Aquatic Ecology at Kent University in Belgium. And I'm basically going to present some of the work of a former uh, PhD student, Maxim Sweetlove, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Christian Wurzbacher of the um, Technical University in Munich and uh, Henrik Nilsson in uh, the Gothenburg uh, University in Sweden. So as you uh, all know, um, polar freshwater communities are uh, dominated by microorganisms and increasingly so with increasing latitude. You probably also know that uh, the Antarctic food webs are uh, highly truncated with uh, large grazes uh, basically missing. Um, high throughput sequencing approaches and studies have shown that many taxa actually are still undocumented, so we find a lot of uh, unknown uh, organisms. And then, of course, we also don't know a lot about the trophic position, the functioning, and the biogeography bio of these organisms. Um, biogeographic zones have been established, uh, but mainly based on macroorganisms in uh, polar regions. Uh, so you have heard about the Antarctic uh, conservation biogeographic regions. There are also um, 23 Arctic uh, floristic zones but uh, we don't really know a lot about the uh, distribution of these microorganisms. In a previous study, we have used 18S and 16S rRNA uh, sequences to uh, investigate uh, the diversity and the distribution of many different phyla. And we have shown, uh, or we have seen that uh, there is a distinct biogeographic uh, zoning for many phyla and uh, taxa also for fungi, as you can see here. But the 18S is rather conservative and doesn't provide a very high resolution uh, view. So uh, fungi, as many other microorganisms, are largely understudied in uh, polar regions. Um, fungi are functionally and taxonomically diverse heterotrophic eukaryotes, as you all probably know. Um, but recent research has shown that actually a large part of them in uh, lake samples are still unknown. And there's also evidence of many new lineages. So they play a key role, uh, both as free living, uh, degrading uh, organisms, but also as parasites or even symbionts. And recent studies also have shown that uh, chytridiomycota and cryptomycota uh, are have a high abundance in polar lakes um, and probably their importance in the food webs are underestimated. So these are rather basal groups within the fungi. So the goal of this study uh, particularly was to use a more high resolution uh, genomic region, the 5.8S to uh, ITS2 in the uh, 18S um, uh, ribosomal operons to have a more detailed view of uh, different lineages uh, and their biogeographical uh, distribution and compare it with 16S and 18S uh, of our previous uh, study to find associations between different taxa. Um, so this study actually is a subset of 87 samples um, from the larger data set. Uh, we have 26 samples from the Northern Hemisphere, from uh, the Southwestern Greenland and Northeastern Greenland. Uh, Svalbard and high altitude lakes in Norway. 
And also from the southern hemisphere, um, we have um, 61 samples from both the northwestern and the northeastern peninsula, Burning Mount Land, Enderby Land, East Antarctica, uh, South and North Victoria Land, and the Transantarctic Mountains. And in addition, we have samples from Macquarie Island and Marion Island in the sub-Antarctic. So you have already seen uh, a couple of pictures from previous uh, presenters. So this is basically how the environments look like. So you have high latitudes, uh, right tundra lakes, uh, like here in uh, Svalbard, uh, here in uh, Schirmach Oasis and Running Mouth land on the continent of Antarctica. At lower latitudes, you have a more wet uh, tundra, like here in Greenland or Marion Island. And basically, this is how it looks like under the water. So we have uh, uh, microbial mats uh, in these lakes, which are uh, in this kind of an extreme environment, rather stable um, systems. Um, biodiversity hotspots and hotspots for uh, primary production, basically with, by uh, cyanobacteria and unicellular uh, eukaryotic algae. But also fungi play an important part in these uh, microbial mats. So we just uh, have had a DNA extraction and then we prepared uh, the library for sequencing according to the protocol by Wurzbacher et al. 2017. We sequenced the library on a MySec uh, platform result in uh, 300 base pair paired and uh, reads. Uh, we then processed these uh, reads through a pipeline, uh, which uh, resulted in swarm OTUs and were classified with the UNITE uh, database. And we also uh, had our 18, 18S and 16S RNA data. Um, processed by the same or through the same pipeline to for comparison so as a result we had about 15 million reads uh, the non-fungi were removed and also the samples with less than 5,000 reads were removed and we retained about 6,500 uh, ITS2 swarm OTUs with uh, the singletons removed as a comparison uh, for the 18S uh, rRNA, we retained about 3,500 fungal OTUs with a mean of about 8.5% uh, of the reads uh, per sample belonging to fungal uh, organisms. But the range was quite uh, drastic from less than, much less than 1% in, for example, Dry Valley uh, lakes up to 73% in Greenland. We found about 10 different phyla, uh, and as you can see here, about 80% of these uh, uh, reads uh, could be uh, annotated to, to four different phyla, with the crypt cryptomycota being the most abundant um, group, with 32% of the, uh, the reads, but also ascomycota, basidiomycota, and cartridiomycota. Uh, having the larger part of the, the reads, also 28 orders. And some of these uh, phyla, as you will see in the next uh, slide, uh, were restricted to only one or two regions. Um, also here we have uh, performed a generalized linear model to um, compare the average richness uh, between the different regions. And we found that uh, the mean richness for fungi is higher in the Arctic compared to Antarctica. Uh, despite this difference, uh, there's no really a difference uh, noticed in the relative abundance of these phyla in the different regions. So here you have it more uh, visually. So you have here the number of OTUs uh, per sample. So for people who not know what an OTU is, it's a, 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 a proxy for a species or a certain taxon. Uh, taxonomy. So here are the, the richness and here you have the relative abundance uh, per sample and you immediately see that um, the Arctic uh, samples which are in blue have uh, a higher diversity on average per sample uh, with the red ones, the Antarctic uh, samples having the lowest one. Um, here you see the relative abundance and you see that the cryptomycota actually is uh, quite important in Antarctica, while uh, Ascomycota and Basidiomycota are the more abundant ones in the sub-Antarctic. 
Here you have uh, several other smaller phyla, and you can see that they are missing from some regions. What you also uh, is interesting. What also is interesting to note is that uh, the unclassified uh, fungal sequences, so they could only be identified at the the fungi uh, the, uh, uh, level, but not on lower phylum or class level, and so on. Um, they have a comparable richness and abundance as the major phylum. Now, we also wanted to investigate the biogeographical patterns uh, using a canonical analysis of uh, uh, principal coordinates, which basically is a multivariate uh, analysis uh, where we predefine groups. So uh, we yeah, put the samples in uh, a certain group, of course, Antarctic, uh, uh, subantarctic and Arctic uh, uh, groups. And then we investigated how well these uh, samples actually uh, fit these uh, predefined groups. And you can see that there's a strong biogeographical pattern with uh, basically the Antarctic samples separated from the Arctic ones and the subantarctic uh, samples also separated from the other um, ones. We also did this for the other data sets and we had the same view, so also for the other eukaryotes and bacteria. To have a more detailed look at the biogeographical patterns for the subregions, we performed a, a ward clustering. We can see that is also there's a major cluster of uh, Antarctic samples, and then you have a cluster of uh, Arctic samples with the sub-Antarctic samples uh, clustering within uh, the Arctic uh, cluster, basically. And this is because the presence of bipolar bas basidiomycete OTUs. Now you can also see uh, an outgroup here, which um, basically consists of uh, um, Antarctic um, samples and one uh, Greenland sample. And this is because the presence of uh, a single, of uh, a dominant um, cryptomycete uh, OTU. When you look into more detail within the, the major regions, you see that the samples themselves basically cluster more or less according to the different subregions. So there is a final biogeographical zonation uh, present. present. Okay. When you look at the distribution of the OTUs, you can actually see that more than 80% of the OTUs are restricted to a single sample. So you have the three colors again, uh, pink for subantarctica, uh, um, red for the Antarctic uh, sam um, samples and um, um, blue for the Arctic, and these are the proportions of OTUs restricted to a single region, and then you have the combination of the different uh, regions, so the gray and the orange. Um, so this actually implies that most OTUs are restricted to a single region, um, with some differences of variation between the different phyla. For example, Petrogymycota, you see that actually the shared the number of shared or the proportion of shared OTUs is quite low. So only about 5% of these OTUs are shared between more than one region. Uh, while for Basidium mycota, this is much higher, about 20%. As a last analysis, I uh, also uh, performed a, a co-occurrence uh, network analysis, uh, which is basically a pair, pairwise comparison between the different data sets, so the ITS to with either the 18s or the 16s. And the first thing you can notice is that the 18s uh, network is much higher than the uh, 16s uh, network, despite that there were more bacterial uh, swarm OTUs than eukaryotes. Uh, so there are more associations between the ITS2 and the 18s, um, and particularly between the ochrophytes uh, and Cytridium mycota and Cryptomycota. And within the ochrophytes, these are mainly diatoms, but also there are metazoa, uh, dinophyta, uh, and streptophyta uh, linking to these uh, groups. For 16s, it's mainly uh, cyanobacteria, which are related to, or have a link with uh, cryptomycota, and ascomycota uh, linked with proteobacteria. So, in conclusion, we can say that. Uh, 
Polar lake microbial mats are dominated by mainly early diverging lineages, uh, but also uh, some Ascomycetes and Basidiomycetes, uh, which suggest a potentially important roles in microbial food webs in these lakes. But there's not a lot uh, known, so a lot of unknown organisms. Uh, the Arctic has the highest mean OTU richness, and there were distinct biogeographical zonations uh, visible, but many OTUs restricted to a single region. So um, I want to thank you for listening. I also want to thank the organizers for, uh, after all, uh, having given me the chance to uh, present this data. I also want to thank the funding agencies and uh, the many people who have uh, helped in sampling these uh, samples. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, the next one is uh, Valentina Cavaglia. Oh, please turn off the microphone. So the next one is Valentina Cavaglia. Yes. Hello. Understanding the microbiome diversity through a combination of remote sensing and close range field observation techniques in the Sorbonne Mountains, East Antarctica. Please, Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, we can see. It's already in the presentation mode, so it's okay. Okay. So, hello, everybody. I'm Valentina Savaglia, a PhD student from the University of Liège and Ghent University from Belgium. And uh, I'm here to present you a, um, a chapter of my, of my PhD, which is understanding the microbiome diversity through a combination of uh, remote sensing and close range field observation techniques in the Surinand Mountains in, this, in the East Antarctica. So, uh, this study focuses on the so-called ice-free area, and uh, uh, they only account for less than 1% of the whole continent. They probably behave as a refugia during the past uh, um, glaciations, and uh, um, there is an evidence of ancient origin that was found in various groups of Antarctic terrestrial biota uh, within them. So, uh, terrestrial habitats are characterized by being very uh, oligotrophic environments and the food webs are highly truncated. Um, so, we know that a very low uh, amount of organic matter is in these environments because of the harsh conditions, uh, like very high fluctuations in temperature, very high fluctuations in uh, uh, humidity content and uh, water content, and also um, uh, light regime and very high fluctuation in uh, UV regime. So uh, it is important in these environments um, uh, the, that there are some uh, places like uh, lacustrine uh, environments, like you can see here, uh, that are pretty stable. And uh, mm, sorry. Um, and also that. Um, um, so um, uh, these environments, uh, um, the terrestrial environments and the aquatic environments in these areas are mainly compos uh, composed by microbial organisms. So uh, the Surrenden Mountains are localized in the eastern part of Antarctica, as I said before, and uh, uh, the microbial project focused on the uh, sampling uh, during three consecutive campaigns. Um, the area around the Belgian Princess Elizabeth Station in Antarctica, that is located here. And um, here I'm going to present uh, the, um, the data that are issued from uh, two consecutive campaigns that occurred in January, February 2018 and 2019. This place is uh, characterized by uh, different environments such as uh, uh, lo localized uh, 
isolated nunataks, uh, and uh, uh, are composed. Uh, these uh, these places are composed by different kind of bedrocks, uh, as uh, gneiss, granite, and marble uh, soil. Uh, there are also places uh, such as the dry valleys and the Yubuku Valley that are characterized by moraine, um, mainly composed also by uh, gneiss uh, bedrock. So. Um, as I said previously, this, um, um, uh, this study was a, a combination of uh, uh, the digital elevation models uh, derived data from uh, high resolution stereoscopic imagery, so from a satellite. So we derived the elevation, the slope, and the orientation uh, of uh, each sample place. And uh, we also uh, placed a small, like, uh, a small data logger. Uh, to measure the soil temperature and the relative humidity that you can see in this uh, small picture here. And actually, we uh, left this uh, uh, data recorder for a whole year. And the, show, uh, the data that I'm going to show you today are characterized by only being uh, the summer um, data. So we then extracted the uh, DNA of all the samples that we collected. Uh, more than 200 samples were collected during these campaigns. And um, we sequenced the 16S uh, uh, general bacteria uh, subunit of the, uh, of the gene and the cyanobacteria specific subunit. And uh, we sequenced everything in an Illumina MySQL platform. We went through a, a, um, an, a bioinformatic workflow and uh, uh, the data that I'm going to show you today are uh, statistical analysis uh, um, that I performed on a subset of uh, this data, of these samples. So I'm going to show you the results of 70, uh, 67 uh, samples and that were taken uh, within 10 different sites. So here I'm showing you uh, an MDS uh, uh, plot of uh, the bacteria results. <clears throat> and I'm also going to show you the cyanobacteria uh, data set. Um, so in these two plots, you can see that there are, diff there are different clustering. So first, uh, the triangles are the mm, granite uh, samples. Uh, the, the circle are the gneiss samples and the square are the uh, marble samples. So the, the symbol represent the bedrock type. And also the colors are represent the site, the different site that we went to, to sample in this area. And you can see that um, different uh, cluster forms in these, uh, in these plots, uh, like we have the lake proximity that uh, have a big influence in the community um, similarity. As well, the bedrock, uh, uh, the granite bedrock and the marble bedrock form uh, very similar clusters. Also, um, other kinds of uh, uh, sites, uh, such the uh, sites that are located here and the very dry uh, environments uh, that are characterized by winds are clustering together which uh, is not the case, of, for instance, for the dry valley uh, clustering Mm, on the cyanobacteria plot, because um, the dry valleys are not uh, very, mm, so the cyanobacteria are uh, not so well represented in the dry valleys um, environment because the conditions are too harsh and uh, the, um, so uh, probably the water content is not uh, very high in this environment. And the arrow of this plot represents the um, continuous variable uh, environmental factors such as slope, relative humidity, temperature, and, and uh, elevation. And the uh, black diamonds uh, represent the orientation of, uh, of the samples that were taken. So I'm going to show you uh, some statistics uh, about uh, the plot that you just saw. So we can see here that the site, the bedrock, and the orientation account for a very high amount, uh, I mean, for a very high uh, statistically relevance in the uh, community um, similarity uh, of these uh, of these environments. Uh, so for bacteria and cyanobacteria, 
for both. And also, um, uh, so the, the continuous variables uh, are also very uh, significantly um, important for this uh, kind of communities. Um, in fact, we have the relative humidity and uh, that account for a very high uh, portion of the uh, variation of the, of the communities. Um, as well, the geography account for a very high uh, portion of the variation, the slope, the temperature and the elevation. So to summarize, we can say that the combination of remote sensing and close range field observation techniques help in understanding the bacteria and the cyanobacteria community structure and species distribution. As well, we saw that the bedrock plays an important role in the community structures. So I presented the results of a data set encompassing gneiss, granite and marble soil sample, which confirms and extends the result of the uh, et al. Um, 2016. So uh, in this study, we added also the marble sample, uh, which account for a very um, big cluster of, uh, of uh, soil sample and the community uh, structure. And uh, uh, we also saw that uh, there is a strong dispersal limitation uh, that occur in this area. Um, and also that all the measured topograph uh, topographic and microclimatic factors, such as elevation, slope, orientation, temperature and relative humidity, uh, signif significantly contributed to the variation in the community composition. So we are further improving the presented data sets by including the 18S um, <coughs> data, the solar radiation, the positive temperature days, the geochemical uh, data and the drone data that were collected this year um, that will uh, probably def uh, contribute in defining clear microhabitat characterizations and the community structures therein. Uh, I would really like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, results. I'm also thanking the funding agency, uh, the Belgian funding agency that funded the Microbian project and that allowed us to uh, perform the three consecutive campaigns uh, to collect the samples and also uh, FNRS uh, and uh, all the Microbian team. Uh, and the technical uh, support we received in the station. And once again, thank you all to uh, the organization staff of SCAR 2020 uh, for providing me this opportunity. Thank you, Valentina. And next speaker is Dr. An Dr. Andrei Vedenin. I hope the pronunciation is right. His presentation is the influence of the polar front on vertical mesoplankton migrations, a case study from the Drake Passage. Yes, please turn on your microphone. Uh, yes, I turned it on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, can you see the yes, entire slide? Yes. Yes, okay, great. So let me please present my talk about uh, the influence of the polar front on uh, deal mesoplankton migrations, a uh, case study of the Drake Passage. Uh, deal and seasonal vertical migrations of zooplankton represent a widespread and well-known phenomenon occurring both in marine and freshwater environments. The deal migrations are panoceanic uh, and their amplitude, depending on the organism's latitude, season and uh, depth, can range 
from a few meters to hundreds of meters. Uh, the most of migrating zooplankton organisms ascend at night to the surface waters. Uh, this is the so-called normal or uh, common migration pattern, uh, which is believed to be caused by the predator evasion uh, during daytime and by feeding during nighttime. Uh, the figure in this slide from previously published research um, shows um, demonstrates such zooplankton movement during dusk and dawn in the Antarctic. However, a uh, reversed movement um, with a nighttime descent to the deeper layers, the so-called negative or reversed migration pattern, is also known for some species. Uh, the negative migration is thought to be caused by predator evasion as well, but um, in case when predators synchronize their vertical movement with the normally migrating zooplankton organisms. Seasonal migrations occur mostly in temperate or polar seas and are driven by reproductive behavior and or uh, by following the phytoplankton blooms. As an example, the nighttime ascent can be more pronounced during the local spring. One of the common ways to reveal and to describe the teal migrations is a night-day comparison of um, various zooplankton characteristics, uh, as it is shown here for the abundance and uh, biomass uh, at different depth. Uh, in particular, a clear biomass rise uh, during the midnight is demonstrated here for the uh, surface waters uh, in the Southern Ocean. Uh, in the Southern Ocean, all the hydrology is mainly determined by the Antarctic circumpolar current, uh, which is composed of several, several smaller currents uh, or jets and uh, related hydrological fronts. The polar front is one of them, uh, which act as boundaries for um, zooplankton communities. Uh, the, um, uh, one of the way to, to visualize the front uh, is uh, to draw a cross section uh, of temperature or salinity units and uh, you can visualize the front by uh, sharper gradients in this case of temperature. Uh, however, um, most of the published investigations focused on vertical migrations. Um, in most of them, the data were um, put in a common pool, in a common um, data set, regardless the front position. And uh, we hypothesized that uh, the fronts, and in our case, the polar front, uh, influence seasonal and deal vertical migrations so of the zooplankton, uh, at least within the upper 300 meters. The material we used was based on four expeditions to the Drake Passage during early spring in October, November, and uh, in summer, in January. Uh, all the samples were taken using this uh, Judah plankton net. And uh, at each station, three poles were taken at varying uh, depth ranges. Uh, the exact depth uh, range of each hole differed from station to station uh, and depended on vertical gradients of temperature and salinity. But in average, the upper layer, uh, as we call it UL, uh, was taken at the upper 80 meters, the middle layer ML from 80 to 200, and the DL from 200 to 300 meters. All zooplankton organisms were then identified the abundance and biomass was measured and normalized per cubic meter. Uh, and the Harlberg rarefaction index, uh, ES100, was used as a biodiversity index. To assess the deal trends of different parameters, we used a gradual distribution of the zooplankton parameters along the day and um, the night day comparisons. Uh, this is the study area. Um, a uh, total of 85 uh, stations were taken and uh, the position of main fronts uh, in each uh, expedition is also shown here. 
the DF is the polar front, the SF is the southern ACC front, and the SAF is, is the subantarctic front. Uh, in this slide, the polynomial trends of the integral zooplankton community characteristics along the day are shown. Uh, the green is uh, abundance, the blue is biomass, and the red one is the biodiversity index. During spring, the zooplankton uh, abundance, biomass, and diversity differed along the day, uh, and the patterns were also different uh, from the northern and southern sides of the polar front. Uh, particularly north of the uh, polar front, the zooplankton demonstrated the nighttime ascent to the surface waters uh, around midnight, uh, probably from the deeper sampled layer, the DL. Uh, south of the polar front, uh, the migration occurred deeper, uh, probably between the layers below the sampled 300 meters and the DL. During summer, the um, abundance, biomass, and diversity, according to the polynomial trends, demonstrated fewer differences along the day uh, comparing to the spring samples. Uh, let us look at the night-day comparisons of the zooplankton characteristics. The dark blue bar charts indicate the night values, uh, the light blue day values. Uh, these are the three uh, water layers sample, the UL, ML, and DL. And we uh, analyze it separately on both sides of the polar front. Uh, in spring, uh, north from the polar front, uh, the abundance in the upper layer was maximum at night uh, and dropped at daytime. Uh, the deeper layers um, demonstrated the opposite dynamics. South of the polar front, uh, in the UL, the abundance's maximum was observed uh, in daytime. Uh, dial dynamics of biomass uh, was similar to that of the abundance uh, on both sides of the polar front, uh, except that the highest biomass was observed south from the polar front in the middle layer. Uh, diversity uh, values were generally higher uh, in the deeper layers on both sides of the PF. The summer samples um, were different from spring samples. North of the PF, uh, the uh, dial dynamics was um, similar to that of the spring one, except that uh, the values of abundance in the upper layer were significantly higher than in spring, as you can see uh, here by abundance units. Uh, in the DL, abundances were lower than, than in spring, and this indicates that uh, the overall summer ascent of the zooplankton uh, to the surface waters uh, north of the polar front happens in summer. Uh, the um, south, south of the PF, the highest proportion of the upper 300 meter zooplankton population uh was observed in deeper layers uh, and the biomass maximum was observed at night in the dl the diversity distribution south of the polar front also uh, shifted to the deeper layers similar to the biomass dynamics uh, and the overall uh, dial difference uh, day and night values uh, of all three integral parameters uh, was lower in summer compared to the spring the described differences in spring and summer zooplankton distribution can be uh, related to the vertical food distribution. In the Drake Passage, the uh, maximum values of surface chlorophyll uh, are observed around November, December north from the polar front, which explains the patterns observed here. Uh, south uh, from the polar front, however, um, the maximum values of chlorophyll, as it was recorded in several previous investigations, uh, were recorded in January, but not on the surface. Um, the vertical distribution of chlorophyll was reported to be more or less even uh, in the upper hundreds of meters. And this can explain the absurd difference in zooplankton distribution on both sides of the polar front. 
deal and seasonal uh, dynamics of the zooplankton was also plotted for several individual species of copepods here. The most prominent seasonal shifts um, were shown for uh, copepods. Uh, and uh, previously, the seasonal changes in vertical migrations were uh, absorbed for these species listed in the, in the first paragraph. We confirmed this and also described the changes of the direction of DL vertical migrations of uh, four species uh, listed here. Uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, the negative migration pattern uh, is often explained by the predator avoiding mechanism. And uh, in our samples, at least two taxa, which are uh, Ithona plumifera and ETUCSP uh, copepods, demonstrated reliable negative correlation with the abundance of jellyfishes and uh, with the members of Paraukita genus. Uh, this is a predatory, large predatory copepod, possibly feeding on, on the mentioned two copepod species. And this can be the evidence that the direction of the deal um, migration of the two copepod species depends on the predator's distribution. So um, our preliminary conclusions and uh, assumptions. The polar front has a great impact on seasonal and vertical migrations of zooplankton and um, vertical dynamics differ uh, on both sides of the polar front, both in seasonal and deal aspects. North uh, of the polar front, the zooplankton concentrates in the upper layer, uh, both in spring and summer, uh, while south from the polar front, the zooplankton um, concentrates in the upper mixed layer in spring and descends to the deeper layers in summer. Uh, in summer, north from the polar front, migrations of zooplankton are mainly concentrated uh, within, the, within the upper layer and large scale geo migrations are not so significant. And conversely, south from the PF, the zooplankton uh, concentrates below. The spring and summer distribution of uh, zooplankton south and north from the polar front can be possibly related to the vertical food distribution, but um, further investigations are needed to confirm this. Although we didn't have um, representative data set to compare the areas uh, beyond the fronts shown in the study area, uh, I mean south from the southern ACC front and north from the subantarctic front, we can suggest that the differences in migration patterns uh, in those areas can differ even more uh, significantly from the described in this study. Some abundant taxa, such as ETDSSP and Ithona plumifera copepods, demonstrated both uh, common uh, or uh, regular uh, nighttime ascent vertical migrations and inverted or negative vertical migrations with the nighttime descent, depending on the season and position related to the polar front, which probably uh, is related to the distribution of their predators. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, yeah. Thank you. I want to acknowledge all the speakers that accepted to give their talk in this web session. And I want to remember you that the session has been recorded and the videos will be available on the SCAR official um, YouTube channel. And the discussion of the data will be next week in the um, portal created on the SCAR website. And the second part of the session will be on July 29th, so uh, in the afternoon at 12.15 in the um, Greenwich Mean Time, we will have other presentation of this session. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, see you on Wednesday.